Buenas and Hafidi, thank you very much for being here. The Committee on Education will now convene this virtual informational hearing. Today is Tuesday, March 1st, 2022, and it is currently 10.01 a.m. For the record and in accordance with the open government law, public notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and the Guam Daily Post on Monday, February 21st, 2022 and a second notice on Friday, February 25th, 2022. Notices of this hearing were also available on the Guam Legislature's website. I'd like to thank my colleague, Senator Joanne Brown for joining me this morning. And of course, to the Guam Education Board and uh, Superintendent John Fernandez and all of our administrators, school principals, and a central staff who are here today for this informational hearing. I'd also like to welcome Senator Tello Taidegui, Hafide. Before we proceed with the public hearing, this informational hearing, the legislature has rules of conduct that must be followed. All must abide by these rules of conduct and quality assurance standards. Please keep your video on at all times and ensure you are in a room with little interruptions and adequate lighting so that we can see your face. Virtual backgrounds should not be utilized during public hearings authorized under resolution number 232-35 of the Guam legislature. The host of this hearing will mute participants until called upon by the chair. When called upon, please ensure you are unmuted and that you are speaking into your microphone. Members wishing to speak may indicate via the in-app feature chat box. Individuals testifying shall be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name for the record. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance and nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character and the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Individuals speaking shall only use respectful and professional language and conduct. The chairperson of the committee may order the removal from a hearing of a committee or subcommittee of any person who is not a member of the in Guahan and who fails to observe proper decorum pursuant to the 36 Guam legislature standing rules. Any violations of these general rules of conduct will result in removal from the hearing by the host. Again, half a day and welcome everyone. We've called this virtual informational hearing to provide an update to the community from the Guam Department of Education regarding the mitigation strategies in addressing the following items for school year 2021 to 2022. The instructional days requirement, service learning requirement, learning loss prevention and mitigation, and post-testing of students. On February 9th, 2022, the Committee on Education received a letter from the Department of Education requesting a waiver of requirements section 7151 and 13 of chapter 7 title 1 Guam code annotated that state at least 180 instructional days or its equivalents including makeup hours each school year with school years ending no later than 30 days following the end of the calendar school year. The second request in the letter for, uh, for a waiver is relative to the service learning requirements pursuant to section 4124B of chapter four, title 17, Guam code annotated, which states that each student shall complete 75 hours of service learning as a requirement for high school graduation. We know that during school year 2019 to 2020, these requirements of students were waived due to the initial effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, which caused a majority of our island to be placed on lockdown and greatly impeded on the education of our students. And since the enactment of Public Laws 35-83 and 35-84, which waived the 180-day instructional requirement and the service learning requirement, The department now seeks to include school years 2020 to 2022 and 2021 to 2022 to be waived as well as we remain in the pandemic. I'd like to thank the Department of Education again for being with us as well as the Guam Education Board 
from the education board. Bear with me, we have a, a lot of folks in the Zoom, but I see the chairman, Mark Mendiola, as well as members, Ms. Felicitas Angel and Ms. Maria Gutierrez Hoffaday, thank you for joining us. And from the Department of Education, Superintendent John Fernandez. And I see. Ms. Lubin Aventi is also here. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, when I recognize you, um, Superintendent, maybe you can help us introduce the other folks in the Zoom room with us today so we know who's here. Uh, we also have Erica Cruz, Deputy Superintendent. And I'd like to welcome my colleague as well, Senator Sabina Paris. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. So I'd like to give an opportunity to uh, the board chair, uh, Mr. Mark Mendiola, uh, for uh, some remarks, re uh, general remarks as we open. Alpha Day Senators, thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate this timely uh, request to have the Department of Education provide um, some updates on this, uh, a lot of things that's going on in the Department of Education. I also see uh, Senator Tello Tadigui uh, with us. I wanna thank you all folks, uh, senators, uh, for caring for the Department of Education because we've been through a lot and we have a lot on our plate, but uh, um, you know, every day that we go to uh, work, uh, you know, our, our, our people uh, in the Department of Education, it's uh, to carry a mission of educating our, our fine young kids, young adults, so that they can be prepared for the future. Uh, today, you see a whole team from, from the Department of Education, and um, we have a lot of set of eyes on a lot of things that's going on within, within our education system. Uh, oftentimes, we can get lost in uh, a lot of the things that we're doing. So this is, will give us an opportunity to uh, share with you, our, our honorable senators, and also our community as to some of the things that we are trying to implement and some of the things and challenges that we are going through within the Department of Education. Obviously, um, you know, when it comes down to it, it's really about resources, uh, funding, human resources as well, and then also getting the resources onto islands, uh, the island that we need to conduct our uh, activities. So um, our board has been meeting, uh, uh, you know, uh, diligently to address, of course, the pandemic, to also address a lot of curriculum issues. Uh, we are pleased to inform you folks that uh, in the upcoming weeks, months, uh, the Department of Education, along uh, with the superintendent and his team, and with the Board of Education, will be un unveiling uh, our uh, five-year strategic plan, which will basically lead um, the Department of Education uh, uh, for the next couple of years. And the beauty of our uh, strategic plan is involves all stakeholders, all their input, and how we're going to uh, put the resources uh, behind uh, what we have been asking the legislature when we, we, we present our budget. Uh, you'll be, you see a cleaner uh, document that will provide uh, you folks with the data and the information as to, uh, you know, uh, st student achievement, uh, also with how uh, we are managing the department and the resources. So in Dunkel and Sidhu Samasi, I want to wish everybody a good morning. Uh, you know, we have a lot of information we're going to share with you folks. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the superintendent and his team will be able to, to respond to a lot of the questions. But the board uh, has been uh, well aware through our work sessions. I want to thank, thank my board members for as uh, citizen volunteers as well uh, to uh, for providing the superintendent and the team guidance when necessary. So uh, thank you for this time and look forward to hearing uh, the, the dialogue between the legislature and the Department of Education. Thank you. Sidious Masi, Mr. Chair, I also want to recognize from the board, Ms. Lourdes Beneventi. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'd like to now recognize uh, Superintendent John Fernandez for any uh, opening remarks. Uh, today, uh, Senator Shelton, uh, Senators Joanne Brown, uh, Telotai Tigui, and uh, Sabrina Perez. Uh, thank you for uh, hosting this informational briefing. And uh, I'll do my best. I'm gonna go ahead and ask our, our DOE uh, folks to go ahead and identify themselves in the chat uh, to assist your staff in, in um, you know, recording who uh, is in attendance. But essentially, uh, in addition to the board members, uh, we're joined by uh, Deputy Superintendent Joe Sanchez, uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Erica Cruz, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Special Education, Tom Babauta. Uh, we have several uh, uh, high, um, sorry, school administrators, uh, as well as uh, special education division staff. 
uh, as well as a public information officer uh, who was also in attendance. I, I believe I've covered uh, everybody and you'll get the details um, in the chat for, you know, for future uh, you know, documentation. I just wanted to say, uh, you, you, know, you summarize it well, Senator Shelton, and we sent a letter earlier and really to follow in line with your earlier action to extend um, the waiver uh, of the 180 days of, in, of instruction, as well as the service learning requirement in order for students to graduate. And you did that back in, in 2020, and we're asking that uh, in order to just be, you know, to be in full compliance, to extend that through the end of this school year. Our intention really is for next school year to, to try to get back to a normal schedule. And we think that, you know, over the past uh, three months, as we've, um, the past couple of months, as we've reopened for five days of instruction uh, through the, through the, um, the worst of the Omicron wave, uh, we feel that, you know, that we're, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to do that, uh, you know, going forward that, you know, and that, and that as public health uh, experts are predicting that we may be, we may see future waves, but hopefully not as severe uh, and, and not as consequential as the earlier waves when we were first uh, dealing with this back in 2020. So if that remains the case, you know, with all of the, the with all of the um, protective mechanisms that we now have at schools, with all of the protocols that we have to address uh, those who are deemed positive, identified as positive uh, for the virus or who are in close contact, uh, we, we do believe that we are able to sustain, uh, you know, schools being open and uh, and return to normal. But how, however, you know, going going back to, to 2020, uh, to school night, school year 2019, 2020, to the current school year, which is 21 to 2022, uh, there are there were disruptions that need to be addressed, and uh, we we ask that uh, both the waiver of the 180 days as well as the waiver of service learning be extended to cover these three years uh, of the pandemic. Uh, this does not, I think, for, I think when it comes to service learning, that's probably the most uh, straightforward. Um, um, item that we're requesting, essentially 75 hours of service learning have to be earned by students in order to graduate. When you pass the waiver, you basically covered everybody who was in high school at the time uh, that, that the law was passed. Um, however, since, two, since we've, uh, not, we're now two years uh, further along, there are actually two classes to whom the service learning requirement applies and all those who are already enrolled and in school in high school at the time of the waiver uh, do not have that same requirement. So technically speaking, you know, freshmen and sophomores this, you know, this year um, have to earn the um, those service learning hours in order to graduate in a couple of years. The the challenge is we have not yet been able to uh, provide you know guarantee and assure these students of adequate um, opportunities for service learning. Uh, through the course of the school year, mostly because of the of the the public health emergency and the safety considerations um, that that go with it. So we do think it would be fair and equitable to ex just extend uh, the waiver so that everybody who was in high school now, uh, through these uh, times where we haven't been, haven't been able to offer these offer these service learning opportunities, be given the same um, consideration with regard to service learning and not have that be a hindrance to their graduation when the time comes. The, um, the 180 uh, days, that, that's been a little bit, even though it, as a waiver, um, you know, two years ago, it, it seemed to be pretty non-controversial. We recognize that it's that we're discussing it currently in the context of also ensuring that we address this topic of learning loss and learning recovery as part of emerging from the pandemic. So we don't uh, we don't believe these are um, uh, these are are ex exclusive you know exclusive issues I guess meaning we just we're asking that the waiver itself be extended in order to avoid any confusion regarding the mandate this year but it doesn't prevent the board uh, and the department from looking at issues such as summer school and how do we want to you know can we require summer school for certain students it doesn't preclude that. It just basically says that this waiver that is in place, uh, which is which is pretty, um, you know, I guess it's a pretty strict requirement, uh, you know, can be addressed while giving us the flexibility to continue our 
discussions and plans for learning and recovery. What I mean by that in terms of um, what I think is a little confusing about the mandate as it stands um, are a couple of things. Number one is last year, uh, you know, we believe that we, you know, even though we were shut down for part of the year, because we moved to distance learning uh, and, and we, you know, moved to offering three types of, of, um, of three models of learning, online, hard copy, and in-person, that we did uh, you know, move to address the 180 days of instruction. However, we do recognize that there are uh, several issues that we might wanna discuss going further, you know, going forward as to how we deal with asynchronous and synchronous learning, how we deal with you know, hard copy instruction, which is almost like independent study. And then of course, traditional in-person learning. Uh, the teachers themselves provide 180 days of instruction uh, we have to figure out what that student experience is going to be like because, again, we, if we start to move and continue continue to provide online opportunities for learning, and and other and other types of uh, uh, you know teaching and learning models, that, that's something that we can you know discuss you know further into the future when the board has a chance to um, you know lay out how we can, how we plan for online learning to continue. This school year, uh, similarly. You know, the, the teachers have provided 180 days of instruction or are on target to do so. But, but we know there was a period of time where students were, uh, who were coming to face-to-face uh, -face instruction were in cohorts. So they, of course, were coming in for synchronous learning uh, on their days where they came in and then they would have, you know, asynchronous uh, education on their days off. And they weren't really days off, but they would have work that they would need to complete during the time where they weren't in the classroom. So having, um, having said that, we thought it would be better to uh, go ahead and ask for the waiver, uh, extend it to cover this school year, and then going forward, you know, we believe we'll be heading back to a, um, a more normal situation where we can maintain five days of instruction uh, for all students. Uh, we were able to do that beginning in November, but between, I believe, uh, the beginning of October to the end of November when we were in, in cohorts, that really affected you know, our ability to, to be clear about meeting that 180 day mandate this school year. Um, so those are the two reasons why we requested uh, the extension of the waiver. Uh, we also we are prepared to, to discuss a couple other issues as you mentioned, um, and we'll, I'll leave most of that for Q&A, but I just wanted to reemphasize, and as I've said publicly that, you know, learning loss is, a, is an issue of course, across the country, across the world, based on the dis disruption of COVID-19 through the past, you know, few years. It seems pretty straightforward, but, you know, I think um, when I say this, I, I hope it makes sense to everybody. And that is that our primary strategy for addressing learning loss is to prevent learning loss by having all of our kids back in school. Um, even though we were forced to go into uh, distance learning due to the shutdown of our island uh, earlier on in the pandemic, what we've learned is that uh, while we do see foresee online learning be a part of our, of our um, uh, you know, our uh, model going forward, for most students, the preferred uh, mode of, of learning uh, is in person uh, where a teacher and, and, and students can interact on a daily basis. Um, and that's what we're trying to get to. And we believe we're, we're gonna be able to do that going forward. So, you know, the first thing we have to do is really keep, make sure that, that schools stay open and that kids have an opportunity to come to school, not just for the academic supports, but also for all the other social and emotional supports um, that we provide uh, in each of our public schools. Once the students are back, that really does give teachers an opportunity to interact daily with students, to assess their academic progress, and then to begin to execute uh, with, the, with the, our, the, the support of all the resources that we're getting um, you know, through the federal funds to begin to support and expand the interventions that are available. So whether it's interventions through the through you know existing programs uh, that we want to expand like summer school um, um, after you know after um, I guess you know night school and so forth um, you know we can do it that way. We've also been able to purchase um, you know significant you know volume of a high quality instructional materials and technology to support those efforts. So we can talk more about you know what what our thoughts are going forward. <laughs> But, but clearly, um, you know, it's something that is, um, you know, top priority for the Guam Education Board and for DOE now that we've been able to reopen um, our schools. 
So, uh, you know, Deputy Superintendent Joe Sanchez is here. Uh, I know uh, our board member, Lou Benaventi, heads the curriculum this, uh, committee, and that's where most of this discussion is taking place. And we can give you an update uh, on those issues as well. There was one other um, uh, issue, I, I think in the amended notice, uh, Senator, that had to do with student vaccinations. So I'll just go ahead and just and put the put this on the record that uh, I think the uh, the reason those questions were raised was I think there were constituents who were uh, concerned about receiving a letter at one of our schools regarding um, a request to provide uh, student vaccination information. So I just wanted to I did I did provide a response uh, to that, and I wanted to just clarify that you know generally and, and overall uh, with public health. Uh, as a partner, we support the vaccination of, of all those who are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccines. And I think we've demonstrated that through the regular uh, after-school vaccination clinics that we've been able to offer to students and their families uh, since the 5 to 11 you know, uh, vaccine was, was available. How, uh, however, the vaccinations are, are remain voluntary and still require parental consent where the students are, are minors. Um, one of the things that we are doing and, and are involved, and, and I need to, of course, think through how we will continue to do this, is uh, is is uh, being able to collect and uh, have information regarding uh, the, the vaccination status of our students. And I think this is akin to the types of information we already require uh, for other vac, you know, other immunizations that students need to uh, to have before they they come to school. Uh, we already do that. We already seek that information from parents to make sure their records are updated. Uh, and that's, and that's you know, pursuant to, to the statute uh, governing vaccines and, and immunizations. Now for COVID-19 vaccination, it isn't required, you know, by the, the, the legislature hasn't required that that be a, a condition of entry into schools, uh, nor are we requiring it. If you don't have, if you're not vaccinated for COVID-19, you're not barred from entering campus. But But at the same time, uh, you know, public health guidance does have different protocols for individuals who are vaccinated, partially vaccinated or unvaccinated. And for that reason, we, we do need a level of information that will enable us to, to uh, implement the protocols for quarantining, isolation, contact tracing that, you know, depends on your vaccination status. So I think the letter that, that was sent out uh, by one of our schools even though that wasn't a district-wide um, um, letter, uh, it was done in an effort to uh, update information relative to student health, uh, information that our school nurses can have so that when they're responding to situations at school, they're able to you know, use that information to respond accordingly. So uh, we will, uh, I think the, the issue about uh, whether or not that information is mandatory uh, was not really clear in the letter. Um, and so uh, you know, again, for the record, uh, you know, if you did not provide information, you were not barred from coming to school. Uh, we definitely will make that clear, you know, to parents and guardians. Should we, could, you know, push uh, future correspondence out uh, to collect that information either now or going into the next school year? So, uh, so I'm glad you brought that to our attention uh, through the committee, and uh, wanted to make sure that we did address it, and we'll give the proper guidance to schools. Uh, but just to let you know, we are trying to. We do believe there is a role for collecting that information, uh, but of course, you know, within public health guidance and all the statutory requirements for confidentiality and ensuring that it's used for the health related uh, purposes that it's intended for. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and um, uh, stop there and be, ha be happy to take any questions from uh, you or the committee members. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Superintendent, for that information that you provided. And I think I'll just ask my questions backwards from uh, from your last point, which was the the letter that parents received regarding uh, vaccination status of students. And yes, we did receive uh, a an inquiries to the committee concerning uh, that letter that was received by uh, some parents who who were concerned that if uh, the department was changing its policy or what it was going to do with the data that it was collecting, and also that there was no uh, opt out option in that form. And if that meant they weren't to return to school if they they submitted it. So we appreciate that information that you provided. Um, I know that uh, we, we touched on all the topics in, in your testimony today. And first, I want to uh, 
thank all of you, all of the administrators from the various schools here, who are here, and as well as all of your central operations from the department and the board who have been working diligently to address all of these uh, concerns about learning loss and ensuring that our students are uh, receiving the education uh, that they, they are entitled to and, and, and being in school as much as they can to make up for all of this lost time that all of our students experienced during the pandemic. And this is a very uh, big burden that all of you are carrying and addressing together. And so uh, I, I know that uh, this is taking uh, time out of your busy schedule in the school day, but we wanna be able to give this information to the public so that we can uh, take action on it in the legislature if necessary and uh, address this in the best way possible. And uh, I wanted to get a little more clarification from you, superintendent, if you can about, or the board, if uh, you're here to answer. On the number of, of days that we're talking about that have been lost uh, beyond the 180 days of instruction, what is the, the number that we're looking at at the end of the day? I, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Joe Sanchez, but I think the when we did the calculation um, for, so again, uh, teachers have been teaching every day, right? Even so, even though we went to cohorts, uh, they were continuing to teach because they teach all, you know, they teach the, the, the both cohorts and are just coming in every day and they're putting in the 180 days of instruction yeah. because the, the law requires that we provide 180 days of instruction. So we, we never assumed that it would be different for teachers and students. So what we pay our teachers for is 180 days of instruction. And then, uh, but when we put our, our students on in cohorts, what we essentially uh, lost were 24 days during that period of time they were in cohorts uh, this school year. So, um, so that's where the difference is. Yeah, 24 okay. days, Anna. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Superintendent and Mr. Chair for that information. And now, uh, Superintendent, I know you discussed in your in your testimony that uh, this is a waiver that you are asking for, but it does not prevent the uh, the board from taking action to mitigate the learning loss. So I want to know from the board, what are the options that are on the table today? Uh, what are we doing to help the students continue learning during this time, uh, aside from uh, just giving okay. a blanket waiver? Right. Yeah, before I respond to that question, I got my colleague, Ms. Marie Gutierrez. You know, I just yield to her for a moment so she can... Uh... Um, she, I think she has a point she would like to make, and then I can respond to that portion. Sure. Ms. Yes, please. Uh, Mrs. Hafiday. Uh, Hafiday Senators, good morning. Uh, first of all, as a board member, but I'm actually representing the IBOX this morning because of the classes that during time, you know, it's class time, they will not be here. But uh, yesterday I forwarded the survey that the Island Board of Governing Students uh, did their survey January 5th to the 19th ahead before the board, uh, department and uh, board are discussing this learning loss. So that's how active this IBOX. And San thank you, Senator, for being there for their off of office. They really appreciate your presence, uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, the survey that they conducted all by themselves, and these are for high school students, is the result came back that 63% of the students that were surveyed said there was no learning loss. Their option if implemented is not to, uh, for the request for the waiver of, uh, not to make up the 24 days. But was but interesting with the comment that they also provided is, <clears throat> and let me just read please. Although this year has been hectic, teachers, have figured out how to fit almost every lessons they wanted us to learn. So senators, these are the students that are speaking out. And um, I know that some may not agree <clears throat> and they want the, uh, the 40, 24 days to be made up, but we these are the students. They were the ones that were impacted, but they feel that they shouldn't make the 24 days uh, so just please consider uh, the Island Board of Governing Students that did their own survey. This is only students. I don't, I didn't, we didn't do the, the parents because I only uh, uh, advise the students. So senators, please consider the request from the students. Remember, they are looking at you guys 
whether you're going to consider. And if we make students first, then we need to listen to the students. And, and you know, they are feel that their teachers have done everything to make the learning go on. And who more is to know but them who are in the who were in the in the classroom during all this pandemic. So uh, I just want to thank you again. At, I am here on behalf of the Island Board of Governing Students as their lead advisor. And they were very fast to do the survey before the discussion on the board and the department. They want to make sure their voices are. Uh, are heard. And if you want, uh, Senators, if you want a copy of that survey, uh, please reach out to Senator Nelson's office because we uh, just followed the protocol that we sent it directly to her. Thank you, Sisus Masi. All right. Thank you. Sisus Masi, Mrs. G. And yes, for everyone in the Zoom meeting, for all of my colleagues, the survey can be found in the Google Drive that was provided to you. And uh, Mrs. Shi, thank you for representing the voices of the students today. We do very much value uh, what they are experiencing in the classroom and that they have uh, taken this time to provide us this information. And that's why it's so important today that we're having the, this discussion to understand uh, what everyone's experience has been and to ensure that we are following the mandates that are in front of us today. And uh, whether or not these uh, waivers are absolutely necessary because at, at the end of the day, the fact is that there are 24 days of instructional time that have uh, been lost and we need to address this in some way. And we're happy that students are feeling that they are still receiving the education uh, that they are entitled to and, and their teachers are doing an excellent job. So we we really um, uh, hats off to them and thank them for all of that service. But we want to ensure that no one is left behind in this process and that we are uh, doing what we need to do on our end as well. So thank you very much, Mr. G. Turn it yeah. back over to uh, Chairman Mendiola. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide response with respect to the uh, recovery. Our board uh, and our, our board meeting, as you can see, we uh, we look to all the stakeholders. We also met with our administrators, uh, you know, parents. Uh, I am a parent of a high school student at Teason High, and the principal did an excellent job in explaining uh, some of the interventions or some of the, the the work that's going behind the scenes at the schools. My wife is also a teacher there, so I get to hear it from that angle as well. Um, you know, uh, we as a board. Um, had uh, instructed the superintendent to provide a, an assessment prior to the end of the school year to determine children that may have need a little bit more assistance than others and provide those uh, interventions, if you will, if that's the word or the term we use in academia, uh, to allow uh, request that they attend summer school or any of the other uh, options that may be available to them. So I guess the, the, the discussion at this point, and we haven't crossed that bridge yet, is whether we're going to make it mandatory or not for those who really need the assistance. So that's an internal discussion that the board is going to have with the superintendent and figure out the mechanics if, that, if that's going to happen sooner than later. One of the things that we, we uh, part of this 180 day, uh, waiver was we can't predict the future, of course. And, you know, with this pandemic and all these variants that pop up every now and then, uh, we just want to be a little bit proactive and ensure that, you know, something does come up and those days turn from 24 to whatever number that, you know, at least we're able to switch to a different mode of learning and still continue to provide the 180 days of instructional time. So uh, as part of the interventions, I know at Teason High School, uh, teachers, there are many teachers out there that go above and beyond during their prep period, uh, during lunchtime to provide tutoring services. Uh, I know through the curriculum committee, um, my, my colleague, Ms. Lou Beneventi and Mr. Joe Sanchez explained some of the other activities that's going on. I think the after school program to some of our other grants, the Escuela uh, Empueni, uh, and then I think there's also an opportunity for some perhaps maybe even credit recovery for some of the high school students. So uh, these discussions will continue to happen, but I think the key component for us was to identify students that need the additional assistance prior to the end of the school year. And then from there, work with the superintendent to really addressing, you know, the gaps in their, their learning, uh, their lost learning, and then and figuring it out from there. And looking from other jurisdictions in the mainland and the U.S. mainland, um, you know, superintendent and I had, had an opportunity to talk to other superintendents across the nation. Some of them never even shut down. Uh, you know, Guam has been very, um, you know, proactive in terms of its mitigation for, for uh, in response to COVID. But, uh, you know, we, we, we went down the path of providing three modes of learning, then we switched to two. 
and then uh, you know having the hybrid both um, 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 on, online and, and face to face. And so we're going to continue to adapt and change. But uh, you know the request really for the 180 days is just to make sure that we are able to um, um, you know uh, meet that uh, portion of of the, the 180 requirements uh, should something come up later on, and just to be proactive in that regard. But uh, yeah, we're, we're well aware that, uh, you know, there are students out there that do need the additional assistance. We have a lot of administrators on this call, and I'm pretty sure I can attest that uh, the message is across the board for the whole entire Department of Education, because that's what uh, we discussed with the superintendent and his team, uh, that they were gonna ensure that we maximize as much of the federal dollars that is uh, set aside to address uh, learning loss. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mr. Chair. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the service learning hours. Superintendent, I know that you mentioned that we have now uh, two classes who are being affected by this requirement, the 75 hours of service for graduation. Uh, can you tell us how many students that is uh, at this time? I, I don't have a count. I would think probably around, I mean, I haven't done a recent count, but we have about uh, uh, nine to 10,000 students in high school. So I would just you know, start with about half of those um, would be a little bit more than half of those would be in freshman and sophomore year. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe we can hear from the principals here today to, to share with us what, what kind of progress is being made to these to collecting these 75 hours of service learning? Are students not completing it at all? Are some uh, getting a few hours here and there? Or is is nothing um, nothing happening right now? If any of the principals want to speak to that, we can start with T's in high school. Sophie, are you on? I'm I'm here, but I'm out sick. But um, as far as the service learning is concerned, we we do um, do some service learning activities uh, just because uh, the teachers do know the value of that service learning uh, project going on. But uh, if there's student participation, it's very low. But yes, it's still happening at school, not as much as it used to though. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Duane. Yes, maybe Mr. Menno. Hi, uh, the biggest jeopardy here is the principles behind um, service learning and that's to develop that civic engagement. So a lot of the projects um, before the pandemic were designed to um, strengthen that, you know, that citizenship uh, in our students. Um, lately because of, and this is a problem specifically for Southern High School, we're um, so far from everything. So a lot of the projects require the students to, um, you know, participate in those um, um, civic engagement activities. Now the teachers are working to see if they can economize it, make it easier uh, where they can do it individually, but it's, it's very difficult at this point. Um, the, a big part of our school is also um, the service aspect of it. So just getting into the community is um, very difficult with all the, the protocols. So we're struggling in, in meeting those expectations at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Adamas? Good morning, Senators. Uh, we do have teachers initiating uh, service learning activities, uh, mostly in school, maybe during class time, having students. Uh, we've had some students along the Kmart intersection, um, displaying poster boards, uh, increasing community awareness. It's easy that way because the students are here. There's no transportation problems. Uh, parents, uh, sometimes it's, it's hard on the weekends or after school for parents to pick up their child or, or to uh, provide transportation. So we, we try to cater to the students this way. Uh, maybe during lunchtime, students will have a service learning table and they'll showcase um, uh, projects that they've engaged in that in, improve their health and their safety and their well being. Uh, we do that as well. But when it comes to students initiating service learning activities outside of school, uh, they don't always get the uh, um, response from the community because of the COVID uh, procedures in place. Uh, parents uh, kind of hesitate 
to have their child participate because they don't want them going to some area in the community and they're scared that no one's gonna safeguard the child from COVID. Uh, and so we, we do our best and, and we're just allowing our teachers to be creative, ensuring that uh, they offer at least five hours of service learning in their class each school year. So what we do is hopefully with the students uh, in six classes, if they participate in those service learning opportunities, five hours, six teachers, hopefully they can get 30 hours this year, but it's not always successful. So we, we're doing our best and I got to thank my teachers for that. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, yes, and thank you to the teachers for trying to uh, adapt to the changes now and provide the opportunities in school, but we understand that it is difficult to still reach that 75 uh, hours. Uh, yes. Mr. Fulo, I, I see from GW if you wanted to share. Yeah, um, we do uh, provide service learning at GW, but the problem is it's usually within within the school. Um, a lot of parents and our teachers are uh, hesitant to put it out in the community. Um, you know, uh, we do what we can, but if if um, it hasn't been as school wide and um, as we wanted it to be. Okay, got it. Thank you. If there's anyone else uh, from the schools who want to share. We also have uh, Ms. Carla Nyan from Simon Sanchez High School. Yes, okay, I'm sorry I didn't see you, but yes, Ms. Ms. Nyan. Okay, maybe we can come back to that, but we do appreciate the opportunities that are available to the students. What our, what our teachers are doing individually to help them meet the, that requirement. Uh, yes, Superintendent. Yes, and so again, similar to the 180, uh, 180 days mandate, I mean, the issue is that um, you know, the, the schools can continue to work on and provide you know, activities um, uh, as, as much as possible. Uh, we just don't want it to be a, a formal hindrance to graduation uh, because we know that over the past couple of years, um, it hasn't been easy because um, to offer those opportunities outside of school. And that's where we really saw a lot of, of hours that you, uh, where students could earn. So, so for instance, if you look back in 2000, you know, 2020, um, the, the coastal cleanup was a big, you know, it was a big um, event and many of our students participate and support that effort. But when it happened in 2020, it was in September at the same time that we were shut down for, for in-person instruction. And you know we can't endorse uh, going out and doing community activities at the same time that we can't open the school. So there's been a disjointed, you know, uh, you know, set of dynamics out there. Uh, so that for us, if there's if the community is shut down uh, or we're shut down, we just can't also endorse our students going out into the community at the same time that we're saying it. So that there, so even though it's been less prevalent and, and less, you know, maybe. This this year, I mean, we still it still is an issue um, having community organizations carry through with their normal normally planned activities, and then also you know ensuring that we're in a position to endorse and and you know take responsibility for students who are going to show up uh, at those activities outside of school. So that's been the challenge, and um, we do hope it'll get better, and we don't hope and we hope that a waiver won't uh, you know discourage schools from continuing their service learning activities. We just don't want it to be a formal hindrance to uh, graduation if they don't meet the full 75 hours. Sure, thank you very much, Superintendent. I think we can all agree that the top priority is safety for our students and for all of the employees at the department. So uh, thank you for that. I'd like to open the floor now to my colleagues if they have any questions uh, regarding the agenda items. So we'll begin with Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I certainly appreciate uh, everyone who's participating in this uh, hearing this morning. I do want to get clarification. Is the time uh, the waiver is being requested for specifically for service learning time? Or are we talking about any other class time that uh, has not been able to be accomplished because of the pandemic? I don't know if the superintendent would be the most appropriate person to respond to that question. So the service learning uh, waiver would only apply to the 75 hours that um, the students are, are supposed to earn over their four year high school 
uh, experience in order to get their diploma. So it would only be those service learning hours uh, that take place outside of class. Was that the only thing we're asking to waive? The other, uh, the other part of the waiver was the 180 days uh, of instruction or its, or its equivalent, that language there. We wanted to um, get the waiver, um, even though we do think that you know, the, there needs to be some clarification in the future as to how that mandate is gonna be laid out. We just think that the, the, that the disruption to the school year over the past three school years uh, uh, merited expanding the waiver that took place at the end of the 1920 school year uh, to um, all the way to 21-22, the current school year, given the fact that we still went through periods of shutdown um, during the past couple of years that were, of course, were not of our own uh, making, but were required as, as part of a government of an island-wide you know, school shutdown. Hopefully we don't have to do this going forward. I think we've demonstrated our ability to keep schools open and to keep kids safe uh, during the latest waves. But um, going backwards and trying to make up for that disruption has proven challenging if we're gonna require uh, making up all those days for all students. So for this school year then, of the 180 days, how many days of class instruction have students had by either being in the classroom or virtual? So uh, what we measured again, the, again, we're looking at it in two ways. The, the teachers have provided 108 or on target right now, uh, hopefully with no further disruption to provide 180 days of instruction. The students, uh, when we brought the, the students back, the in-person students back at the end of um, September, because we had that shut down for a few weeks in September, we actually brought them back in cohorts due to the concern uh, with the Delta variant at the time. So we were trying to lower the number of, of students on campus. Uh, so we had two cohorts where one group came on one day and another group came on, the, on alternating days. So those students uh, missed uh, 24 days that they would have normally received during that period of time. So it's 24 days for those students. Um, and then with regards to service learning, was any, was any thought put in place understanding the circumstances that we're in ahead of time of, uh, you know, altering the policy in advance so that um, because of the challenges, as was mentioned, of course, with students, especially these young people, I mean, they're going out into an environment they're not necessarily used to at that age. But was any thought put into place on what alternative could be, be um, addressed as a policy, uh, considering the circumstances, perhaps these young people were not able to go out and do their community service learning, what would be an alternative versus simply waiving that time? Because I'm sure for different students, it, it obviously will come out to different hours, but was an alternative put in place considering we were under this pandemic and exposure, you know, out there probably were not the best thing for them under the circumstance, but what, what alternate policy could have been put forth so that we're not here saying we're waiving, but that there was something else they could have done to fulfill that requirement. Uh, and, you know, the board could adopt it so that in the interim, until we got through the challenges of this pandemic, you know, they could meet some requirement uh, to, to fulfill their graduation needs and, and yet not be put in an adverse circumstance of, of having to go out in the community. Right. So as, as you as you've heard from our schools, they are uh, they are uh, doing service learning within within school. So they're looking at opportunities within school. Uh, where they don't have to, you know, find outside organizations to support those efforts. So there is that thought and there is that uh, ongoing uh, um, set of activities going on. I think the issue is having the, the, the uh, breadth of different uh, types of activities that students can choose from that normally take place in partnership with our community members that are not taking place or which are taking place at a time where we can't endorse students you know, being out in the community at the same time that their schools are shut down. So I do think, uh, you know, as you've heard from our principals that there are students who are still doing service learning. Um, there, there, there may not be as many participating um, due to different limitations, whether it's you know, due to you know, parent con parental concerns about participation uh, or you know, they might be, you know, we've got a lot of kids over the last you know, um, two years, definitely during the last wave, we were just out of school because you're quarantined and you're, you know, isolated and so forth. So it's just the disruptive, the disruption that's taken place, which is limiting the amount of hours that would normally be available to students. And like I mentioned, you know, the, the big events that typically happen in the community, the 5Ks, the cleanups, all of those things that normally happen are now much more limited 
So it really does put the pressure back on the schools to figure out if they can make these 75 hours in school and you know, can they get everybody to participate? And I think that's what you're hearing, it's proof challenging. Um, whether it's getting the number of activities or getting all the students, you know, um, on, keeping them on track to uh, earn the hours that they need to, to uh, proceed. And with the waiver, um, with the waiver, our juniors and seniors this year are already exempt from that requirement based on uh, what was done in 2020. So it really is the incoming freshmen and sophomores that uh, are actually not covered by the exemption and the schools, are, the schools need to technically figure out how to uh, address service learning, even though we just own, we've only been really back to five days of, in, of, of in-person instruction consistently since November of this school year. So, um, well, sure, so, so yeah. certainly your, your, if I can add your, I mean, I, I assume your freshmen and your sophomores will have time over the next couple of years or several years to be able to make that up. But I'm not gauging that there was a collective policy decision put in place as an alternative that students could pursue uh, understanding the circumstance of not wanting to, you know, or, or choosing or parents, whatever the case may be, of wanting their children to be out there. But has, has any alternative been looked at now as a policy versus giving a waiver moving forward? Since we really don't know why we, you know, we see the weakening of this uh, virus, we don't know how much longer, uh, you know, we're gonna be wearing masks and having these type of restrictions. So is that something is maybe the chairman of the board can answer? Are you looking at an alternative? Because, you know, every time we give a waiver understanding we are under the pandemic, but keep in mind, as we are aware, other school systems have been able to accommodate and adjust, which we see DOE does not necessarily have, perhaps because of the size and magnitude of the student population that you serve, has not had the ability to adjust as quickly. Um, yeah. And I, I recognize that, but at the same time, I think we want a demonstrated reality that the because as large as you are, you also have the biggest chunk of, of, of the taxpayer dollar. You also have the largest operation in the government of Guam. So, you know, to what much is given, much is also expected in return and, and some foresight with regards to advanced policy, knowing that, you know, we can't necessarily and, and there be reservations of having these children being exposed out in the community. Has the board considered an alternate policy of, of what other program could the children participate in or students participate in, in the, you know, until we get past this so that they can still meet the requirement? Because I certainly don't want to give the impression to our young people that, well, you know, if we can't make it, that's okay. We'll, we'll waive it and we'll not worry about it. Um, you know, I think we should demonstrate every effort moving forward that we're trying to fulfill these obligations. And if we're not able to, we have a justifiable reason or we show we put an alternative policy forward so that they can still meet some requirements because they'll never have this time again to go back in their, their high school years, obviously, and make up this time. And I, I don't want to keep, you know, our children that are ready to graduate, you know, I think we're all, they're all looking forward to that, holding them back. So, I, but I also want to, you know, I, I, I expect a little more. Uh, and Mrs. Gutierrez had mentioned that the students, of course, they don't want to make up the time. If I was a student in high school, I wouldn't want to make up the time. I'm not surprised, you know, by the survey. That's expected. I, I would not want to make up the time either. I want, I want to look for my summer vacation, other things that I've planned. But, you know, as, as policymakers, as administrators, certainly as board members, uh, we want to know that every effort has been made and that we don't use it as a reason as to why. Uh, we're not maximizing the opportunity because the fact, and again, I, I am a little concerned about the fact that DOE cannot adjust There's no reliance on technology that's like, needed. What if it uh, crashes? How do you back yourself up? Especially yeah. when well, I see private schools, I see charter schools able to do that. Down. So understandable, you know, Chairman uh, Mediola, that's, uh, yeah. you know, it's not un down. unreasonable, obviously, yeah. for us and the public to expect a, a greater effort. So I just yeah. wanted you to respond to those questions. I know yeah, there's a thanks. lot. Thank Pretty you, Senator Brown. Yeah, thank you, Senator Brown. I appreciate the comment and and the uh, you know from that perspective, I seriously wish that we had the blueprint to solve the problems of this pandemic. You know, we've been taking our guidance from public health and external agency to the Department of Education, and so to really craft a policy, uh, especially when this service learning is actually legislation, this is law, and that's the reason why we're coming to you folks for that consideration. Um, you know, obviously you heard from some of the administrators that they've had to adopt and adapt to certain situations. I think one of the things that we're faced with, Senator Riddy, is a lot of parents are very skittish about having their children go out there into the community. I mean, let alone some of them uh, having taken the option to go on to um, 
uh, uh, online learning. Some of them are, are not on a face-to-face -face, uh, 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 part. And so, you know, I mean, in all the wisdom of the Department of Education, we have a lot of people that are, are really behind trying to solve a lot of the challenges. And so, obviously, when we come before the legislature, there's a lot of thought put into our thought processes. And when it comes to the board policy uh, with respect to this, we're really following the law. And we are uh, definitely looking at different ways to address the, the learning loss opportunities. But when it comes to service learning, it's really just putting folks out there into the community and trying to uh, get to that. I get the point. And if that discussion uh, uh, needs to happen at the, at the board level and the policy level, I'm pretty sure the principles and we can come up with creative ideas to address it. I wasn't looking at it from, the, to be honest with you, I was looking at it from that perspective. And I think that uh, is something that definitely we can take, uh, take under advisement and, and look at that opportunity to uh, give alternatives, uh, if you will, to, to our students to, to, that want to do that. Like I mentioned, I have kids in the school system. I have a, a child in high school. And <clears throat> as a parent, I go out there, we pick up trash, we go out and do community service. I and mean, that's just parental involvement. And I think really Senator, that that's the key is uh, we got to be able to provide those opportunities for our kids. But the purpose of service learning is really, it's just to provide kids an opportunity uh, beyond just the classroom setting to give back to the community. And it, it goes to that, uh, to that extent, in my opinion. And so um, I, just having my children volunteer and do things out there, I, I do it as a parent. And I think that's a challenge. We have a lot of families that are not able at times to, to do that. A lot of parents have to work. And I'm not trying to make excuses, but I think at your point, to your point, uh, definitely I would like to look at that uh, with the superintendent and perhaps the team and see if there's all other alternatives. But uh, I do know that when we came, the reason why we're coming before you folks is it's mandated in law that we have to meet the, the, the service learning hours and you know calculating moving forward uh, and the opportunities that may not be uh, may not present itself to our kids based on the, this current situation we're in. And, you know, with the, with the public health guidance that we were receiving, um, you know, it went from no gatherings larger than 25 or first 10, then 25, and then now you can go to 100. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's really parents also that have to make a, a decision whether they're going to allow their ch children to uh, be involved in these types of activities. But absolutely, uh, I know that we can look to other jurisdictions and probably see how they're addressing those issues. So I thank you. I value the point. No, and I, and I appreciate your input, you know, Chairman Mendiola. I mean, I know you and I know you're a very active and engaged parent, irrelevant of the DOE system or even in your current capacity as chairman. I think we all wish we had more parents that were as engaged and just like you, many parents work, but, you know, probably it's something we need to look at is, uh, you know, we, we've accommodated for so many years parents not being as engaged with the expectation the government, the educational system somehow is going to be all that to their children. And, and we're seeing the challenges that our, our young people are facing as a result of, of not having as many parents engaged. But again, I think it's something the board should look at, uh, at least for the whatever time is remaining with this pandemic. If there's an alternate program that can be put in place and maybe proposed to us. Uh, in the interim until we can get back to some sense of normalcy. I, I have no issue with the, you know, the community aspect of it. I think it's a very good thing. I mean, you know, uh, I, I was not a high school student in the DOE system. I did spend nine years in public school. So majority of my education has been from, from the public school system here on Guam. But I just think something perhaps can be looked at in the interim, even if it's a project that the kids can do within their school system to accommodate that because when you hear that you know we're asking to waive the general view is going to be oh my goodness we're not meeting another requirement and they're asking for an exemption uh and you know with all the challenges we're facing with our, our children and trying to get as many of them as well educated for the next step in their life uh you know that's kind of not the message you want to hear so i'm just relaying that i hope uh you know you continue to be more proactive with it but definitely uh, look at a policy change. Laws get made for a whole bunch of reasons, but laws can also be changed or amended if needed to accommodate to the, the demands and expectation of the public. Uh, but certainly, I think that's something perhaps the board should look at in the interim is what's an alternative. So next year, we're not here if this pandemic continues saying, oh, we need another waiver uh, with regards to this particular policy. But again, you know, I, I know a lot of good work is being done, but but understand as well, uh, you know, the public view of expectation of delivering because you are the single largest entity in this government uh, that demands the most resources. And while we feel and know our children are very important, we also have an expectation of deliverables. Uh, and we can't slip and slide because, oh, it's DOE, let's put it under the umbrella and we let a lot of things go that we know uh, are not up to standard. We should expect more.
Yeah, ma'am. Was so that what was I that point? Relaying that uh, and and want to relay those points to you. And with that, thank you. I, yeah, I go thank ahead. You. you have something you want yeah. to add? Yeah, with add? that point. I'm excited because we're going to be unveiling our strategic plan and those deliverables and all that stuff that's going to be in there. You're going to be able to see measurable results from the Department of Education. Not that we don't have it now, but we're going to put it in a manageable, meaning, meaningful uh, way, and we're going to tie it to the resources. I mean, obviously, we're the, like you said, we're the largest agency. I wish we're a revenue generating agency, but we're not. You know, we rely on the general fund. And because of that, our mandate is specific by the Organic Act. We have a lot of things that we have to uh, carry through. And whenever you have legislation that puts stuff uh, more pressure onto the department, uh, you know, uh, as far as when it comes to resources, of course, we have to figure out. But we have this little reset press button by Uncle Sam. So we have a little bit of resources that we're planning for the future. And that's the key. But we also have to be, realize, Senator, that when that money runs out, what, it, what commitment are we going to be able to receive? And that's the reason why the strategic plan is very important. Because... Uh, we're in this point, we've been planning and we're going to execute and we're not going to shelve this plan. It's going to require, if you look at the way our board uh, meeting structure is assembled now, we have these dashboards. It gives us a snapshot on student uh, achievement. It gives us a snapshot on facilities. It gives us a snapshot on everything that the, the department deals with. And the board's going to have the, uh, the, uh, the, the relationship with the superintendent where we're going to be able to resolve issues basically uh, as they come uh, available, uh, as it comes to us, and uh, on a quarterly, monthly, and also on, a, on an annual basis. So I'm really excited that I, I look forward to your engagement when we unveil that, because I think you are going to see that the department has not been, um, you know, uh, teleworking, and we actually been coming to work and 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 doing what we need to do to execute a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of people behind this plan. I just want to thank Joe Sanchez and the superintendent, uh, my colleagues on the board, because. Once we unveil this, it's going to show the the, the 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 legislature and the leadership of how we're managing going to manage those limited resources. So thank you, ma'am, for that, those comments. Well, I appreciate it, certainly, Chairman Mendiola. The odds are probably fairly good. I'll be there when you provide the provide the presentation, uh, and uh, and we look forward to it. I mean, uh, and we also want to know how the how the department's also going to be as effective with regards to the dollars that are available because I also hear the tone of the expectation that you know every year the, the amount of appropriation would continue to increase and increase uh, and you know do we have the financial resource to accommodate that with all the other obligations so we want to make sure everyone's fairly carry, you know carrying their load uh, and that the money is being you know spent effectively. Um, and I also would, would like to see also how we're streamlining to ensure that the most basic education is provided. Because I see over the years that we continue to expand all the things we want children to do and learn. Uh, and then you've got those that are falling through the cracks that are not even learning the most basic of things and basic skill sets of education that they need to graduate and be engaged members of our community. So I definitely look forward uh, to your presentation and, and listening to the engagement of how we're gonna address the score levels and making sure that as many of our children are, are benefiting from our school system and are able to be functional and contributing members of our, our community. So again, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you also superintendent, everyone's participated, but I just wanna relay that, that simple underlying message. I mean, there are great expectations of what we, we want to see from our educational system because so much of who and what we are in this community is dependent upon, and the majority of our students in the system and in our community are dependent upon the work that's being provided by our education, our public educational system. So thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to be able to question and comment with regards to these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Brown. I know the superintendent and both Mrs. G have their hand up. So Mrs. G, did you wanna make a comment? Uh, thank you, Senator. You know, I'm sorry to be very straight out. You guys have, a, senators, you have a lot to learn about GDOE. We do not close our doors to any students that come to register. The service learning is a mandate by the legislature to be implemented school year, class of 2015. And from there, it continues. And there, the, the, the department was only, uh, um, tasked to develop the standard operating procedures. As far as the school providing ways of, for, for the students to provide service learning, the school, and I know this for a fact, that's why I invite you to visit the schools. Visit the schools. They provide students that <clears throat> provide tutoring to their peers. Students who are asked because of this pandemic, donate any canned goods, dry food, 
to be distributed to our, um, our less fortunate stu students and families. I know that for, that for a fact, because my two grandchildren that goes to Simon Sanchez, if they have to, they bring in weekly and that's uh, put into their service learning. Students that attend uh, uh, their sports and help out, students that attend meetings at their schools, the IBOX learns, uh, earn service learning. So the schools have been very innovative in finding ways to provide service learning to the students. So because it's the law, that's why we have to go to the legislature to waive. So amend the law and remove service learning, okay? Because the time this was, um, was introduced, the Department of Education was in opposition. But of course, it, it passed. And then the, the thing about, you know, Senator Brown, in all due respect, the budget of DOE, of course, ha goes up every year. We have, by law, it's a sal that's their salary increments for all employees, just like any government agency. We have teachers reclassification. So, of course, every year, insurance uh, rates go up. That is why the Department of Education's budget rise every year. We have wonderful teachers. We have successful students, but we need also the legislature to stop introducing mandates and look at the, the mandates that is really tying up the budget of DOE because we have to follow. So I ask you, all of you that are here today, the senators, look at the 14 points, adequate education. Can you look at that? And, um, and review and amend because our budget is based on the 14 points and it's a mandate. So I just want to ask all of you to please work with us. We have wonderful teachers. We have hardworking employees. During the pandemic, they never stop working and learning never stop. So I, I, I hope that one of you will take that lead and amend and or repeal the service learning, but service learning is happening right now at the schools. It's a board part, it's not a board policy because if it was a board policy, we would have already uh, uh, rescinded that, but it is a mandate. So I just ask you and us to work together, visit our schools because you're always welcome, especially during this time and see what our employees have to go through every day, five days a week, they are all moving so fast to accommodate our kids to see. So I just wanna thank you and I, please, when the, the budget comes, remember, we are mandated by law. Employees gets their salary increment, our teachers reclassification. That is why every year that our budget goes up and we cannot pick the cream of the crop students as they come to register for DOE. We accept all kinds of students. We welcome them into our campus. So I just wanna make that known that yes. the service you, learning Mike. is a law. It's not a board policy. I hope it's, you guys will rescind that, remove that so it will not be hard on the, on the, at the school. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mrs. G. Superintendent. I just wanna, I just wanna, I guess, communicate out that I think that um, you know, Senator Brown, you mentioned um, what I what I read to be uh, an echo of, of of this narrative about DOE, um, you know, needing to needing to have responded more quickly or better in you know, looking back over the past. But you know, I think, in retrospect, as we as we clear through this pandemic and look back, uh, I think we will appreciate the role that DOE has played in in, in this effort. I mean, um, we did have to really explore and, and really figure out the various roles that we play in, as part of a community effort. And that's why, you know, as you, as you know, I mean, from the beginning, we, we served 7 million meals to families who depended on, on us for, for daily meals. And that's a function that we, we do, but don't necessarily, you know, highlight as part of our efforts. But, you know, during the pandemic, when it was needed, uh, our employees were out there delivering food, handing out food, uh, delivering commodities. Uh, the public health effort re required us to be on the front lines with, with public health officials. So, you know, we were there to support those efforts outside in the community and also back in school. 
uh, knowing that when we had to receive our kids back, we had to focus on on what those safety protocols would be. And you know, it, it wouldn't be the same. You know, uh, coming back to school, uh, welcoming our kids, there would be a whole set of rules and and practices and behaviors that needed to be reinforced as part of that. You know, um, CPS reported uh, when schools reopened the back of the uptick in neglect cases that were that were reported because during the shutdown, we didn't have our educators there on the front lines helping uh, watch out for the well-being of our kids. And as we slowly uh, come back, you know, to to where we are today, the effort has always been to kind of you know, grow, you know to to focus on you know, continuing to fulfill some of those priorities and then getting our kids back into the routine of coming to school and now you know being able to have the luxury i think of talking about learning recovery uh, you know because you've run one of the bigger organizations in government that when we say we can't adjust it's not that we can't adjust is that when you're moving a ship you can't go from one day we're open to another day shut down so in the past we've had to deal with that due to factors and decisions that are not entirely within our within our our purview but I think we're getting past that. And I think now that we're left to determine, you know, how to proceed uh, as we hopefully exit this pandemic, that's gonna serve us better. So, you know, I think the board and we've been working to, to really sort through the priorities. The, pri the, the priority that we've had for the most part is getting our kids back, getting our kids back in the classroom, sustaining five days of instruction a week, because without that, we can't do much of anything else. We can't recover learning, we can't provide you know, more service learning opportunities. So I think we've reached that goal in November uh, when we, when we, the board uh, decided that, that now we were ready to return. We withstood the, the, the impact of Omicron. I mean, our priority then was to keep schools staffed up so we didn't have to close. And as you know, other school systems on Guam did close over that time period, but we felt that it was a priority for our students to maintain five days of instruction for them to come to school uh, and you know, get through the the worst of it by by supporting our schools and the staffing shortages. So I do think that as we you know as we move forward, uh, you know, we'll be able to address these other requirements. I think right now we just came to say, look, these are in law. Uh, we could use the flexibility so that we can uh, determine how we can recover th this lost time, um, how we can you know make sure that we are offering service learning. But we certainly didn't want to wait uh, wait until graduation two years from now to figure out that a lot of students weren't able to make up those hours. So I think that's part of being proactive as well. So I, I do agree, though. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk with the board and see if there's anything else um, that needs to happen policy-wise or in changes to the law. But I just wanted to share that that you know, it's you know, just if you look back over the past month, the priority was keeping our doors open because you know we had so many staff members who had the quarantine, isolate, uh, but we felt that it was important to send our central office staff out there, try to keep the schools going because kids needed to come to school. Um, that's how we're gonna stem learning loss. That's how we're gonna take care of their well-being. That's how we're gonna do service learning is make sure that we're open and we stay open. And I think that's our commitment. And we've learned a lot from this public health emergency, but we certainly know that we offer a lot you know, as well and that if we're closed, there are many things that can't happen. So, well, we'll definitely- uh, Mr. Work Superintendent, I, I, I won't be labor, Madam Chair, too much longer. I mean, I appreciate your response. Granted, you, you have a major operation to address and, and also this pandemic has been unprecedented. Hopefully in our lifetime and our children's lifetime, we don't have to go through it again. But I think it's looking at where, where others might have been able to even be more successful and looking perhaps there's programs you can adapt because as you break down your system from where you're at, you've got the individual schools, the individual principals, the administrative staff, the support staff that come with that to see how we can improve on it. I mean, I'm glad I've stirred it up because I'm not going to be the senator who's going to sit here and pat everybody in the back and say, great job, you know, isn't this wonderful? I'm, I'm going to want to challenge because I think that's an expectation that we want to see how can we improve and build upon. And if there are things that we can make better by all means. I'm not the center that's going to be breathing down your neck with mandates left and right and bills left and right uh, to add on because I really think uh, education in some ways has gotten so, I don't know, I can't even imagine what to say about it. I think we've put, added so many more things that we're losing even the basic ability of, of students to, to be at a certain level in terms of their comprehension, their reading skills, particularly their writing skills, uh, so that they're prepared. Be They want to go out into the service community. They want to go into higher education. 
I think we, we know we want to meet them at a certain standard that they reach in order to be able by the time they, they're in the 12th grade, that they can move on to the next level. And, and that's what we want to see. I'm a product of the public educational system. The foundation of my education has been in public school. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, who and what I've been able to accomplish in my life, I very much owe to that. But I also want to see how we're challenging ourselves. So I appreciate Ms. Gutierrez, your comment. I, I doubt I'm the sponsor of the service learning requirement. I, I think it's a good thing, uh, but but I'm not the one you know throwing out these mandates. I'm sure I voted for the 14 points when they were put up back in the day. Uh, but with regards to standards, I mean, those are things that we can always come come and revisit as we evolve. And if you're seeing there's a big gap that we're not taking care of the most basic fundamental educational requirements our kids need because we're layered with so many other requirements. And maybe we need to look at that because I want to make sure that our kids, as you do as educators, by the time they reach the 12th grade, that they've got those basic skills that they need in life. All the other stuff is nice and it's fluffy and you know we can take credit for it, but if it's weighing us so far down that we're not able to meet our most basic mandates, then maybe we need to remove some of those layers uh, so that we can meet the most basic needs of our children. So again, thank you uh, for all of you for the opportunity to comment. I hope it stirred uh, more discussion and thought, but that's what we should be doing. Okay, Madam Chair, thank you so much for thank the opportunity you, again. Brown. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to Senator Perez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everyone in Guam Department of Education. I know this has been trying times during the pandemic. Uh, we do uh, understand uh, all the efforts that you've gone through and, you know, as far as ensuring the safety of, of the uh, community, the educational community. I just want to bring it uh, back to learning loss. And I, I think, you know, in the past, you know, we thought exemptions from service learning requirements and instructional hours uh, during, you know, the the the, the height of the pandemic, you know, when it first started, uh, seemed to be, uh, you know, reasonable. But I think moving forward, you know, looking back, perhaps that might have been, you know, are there impacts, were there impacts to the exemptions and how it, you know, perhaps is adding to the learning loss. And we all know that um, the pandemic has exacerbated uh, existing problems. Um, so there, you know, perhaps the learning loss that, that was already existent uh, has now been exacerbated because of the, the distance learning, the hard copy learning, um, you know, the, which is really self-study. Um, and, you know, UNICEF has put out a report saying that uh, this is one of the biggest issues with children these days, uh, uh, internationally. Learning loss must be recovered to avoid long-term damage to children's well-being and productivity. And so I think, you know, with the pandemic, you know, we all wish to go back to the old days, right? The old days of, um, you know, going back to what we were used to before. And what this pandemic has showed us is that, you know, it's here to stay and, you know, we can't ignore it, we have to adapt. And I think that's what we've been trying to do. And so, but I think more can be done in regards to, um, you know, what are the best practices? How we come up with best practices to adapting to this pandemic we all know that face-to-face -face learning definitely is superior to the distance learning when it comes to our children. And I, you know, I thank you for, for making that bold move, but I still think that you know, safety is, is definitely a, still, still a concern. Um, so I, I am in agreement with uh, Senator Brown that you know, what are the alternatives? What are the best practices? Um, I know considering that the, you know, the federal government has provided some subsidies uh, to address uh, the pandemic, um, you know, both in regards to providing PPEs, but also now, you know, I'm interested to hear more about what the federal government has, if they have provided any guidance in regards to learning loss um, and any best practices that you can provide, you know, as alternatives, because I think if we provide exemptions, we're really, you know, I think we're setting a bad example for our students that, you know, if we're, we could just let things go because, you know, we couldn't achieve it. And I think, you know, we really need to to really, you know, try harder, you know, to set that example for, for our students that, you know, you have to, you know, the more effort that you put into something, um, the more, you know, success that you can get versus, you know, just, you know, relaxing the rules, right? So, um, you know, what has GDOE, and maybe this is a question for the superintendent, um, you know, what, what sort of plans do you have uh, in, in looking at best practices uh, to address learning loss? So I, I think the maybe the, the first place to start that is that we're learning loss is is an issue. It's not necessarily an issue of uh, it's, it's not merely an issue of instructional time. 
All right. I think that's I think that's one of the issues we're we're, we're looking at here is that is we do believe that learning loss is an issue that needs to be addressed, and that we are looking at strategies to address you know those um, those issues going forward. But it's not simply an issue of well, if you have learning loss, you know, you, you just add more days. I and mean, we're really talking, I think with, um, with what the committee has been discussing uh, with, our, with our students, it's really, uh, you know, assessing students, determining who's in need uh, and, and most in need of those types of interventions, and then, uh, and then uh, providing those interventions and strategies. So it might, it might be that more instructional time uh, is gonna be needed for some students, uh, maybe not all students. And, you know, looking at that, having that flexibility to, to assess and design those interventions accordingly is, is, is I guess, what we're looking for. Um, so even with the waiver of the 180 days, where I think if, if, if we were to try to apply that would mean all students coming back over the summer and all, and all teachers working beyond their contract to uh, meet the 180 days, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody that learning uh, will be recovered if not designed um, strategically and with the focus on, on what, where those areas of loss losses are. Um, I think the best thing to do at this point, I mean, Joe Sanchez, our deputy, has been leading our conversation with the committee, and, and he can give an update as to where we are in uh, the discussion about how to move forward. And again, it hasn't really been tied to the 180 days mandate. It's been tied to, you know, uh, how do we measure law, the loss? How do we address the loss? And how do we, you know, proceed to, um, you know, to address it going forward? So it looks like you started. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Joe. Joe? I guess, thank you, sir, and, and thank you, Senator, for, for that question. I can appreciate the comments because I know that as a former teacher uh, or as a current educator, even though you're uh, in your role as a Senator, uh, you can appreciate the work that goes into this type of planning and you know discussions uh, with teachers and administrators and people at all different levels of the department. So in the last few months, our schools have already been implementing a variety of strategies and best practices that have been provided to them uh, through, again, a variety of sources. So we're not just looking at the U.S. Department of Education. They are our main source of resources, obviously financially, but they also provide a lot of research summaries and recommendations that we take a look at. Uh, the CCSSO, which our superintendent is uh, part of as well. Uh, the NASB organization, the National uh, State Boards of Education. So we are very, you know, up to speed when it comes to what are the best practices throughout the country and the world uh, when it comes to addressing, um, you know, addressing what is called uh, learning loss. And I think uh, you're probably also kind of up to speed on, on the language that's used. And there's a lot of educators out there who do not like and who kind of uh, downplay, not downplay, but, you know, turn away the term learning loss. Because how can you lose learning, right? I mean, if you, if you learned it, you learned it. If you if you don't have it anymore, then you didn't learn it in the beginning, right? So the terminology is something that you know we try to uh, move away from when it comes to the negativity that's kind of implied uh, with statements, uh, you know, like that. Unfortunately, uh, the U.S. Department of Education uses that term also when it when it comes to the funding that's provided, right? So it's it's I think that's something that is going to continue to um, be a point of contention. But, uh, you know, we've uh, put together what are called the approaches and strategies to support accelerated learning. Accelerated learning is one of those best practices that has been out there and is now being supported by more research, uh, you know, with uh, a lot of the school systems because the it's based on kind of two fundamental principles. Number one is it's like the superintendent said, it's not the quantity. It's really the quality that that we're, we're trying to look at, the quality of the time that the teachers spend uh, with their students. In fact, a lot of the states are, are focusing their funding, not just on intervention strategies or strategies that take place after school, but a lot of uh, states and districts are focusing their efforts to improve the current quality of education in their, in their, in their systems. And that's exactly what uh, we're trying to, to do is make sure that we increase the quality of the instructional time that's provided. That's something that research says has to be done before you even consider interventions. I think a big mistake that, you know, a lot of folks um, kind of started going down, you know, when they started asking about, oh, are we gonna extend the school day? Are you gonna add after school programs? Are you gonna add tutoring programs and so on? But what a lot of folks who work in this field the, the field of interventions uh, tries to emphasize is that you have to strengthen what happens in the regular day first. 
you have to, it's called core instruction. When you've heard of RTI, response to intervention, one of the basic principles in RTI is that you have to focus on, you know, core instruction first and make sure that that's of high quality. So I just want to go ahead and share with you what we've come up with. And as, as you can see, each one of these practices has a very strong foundation when it comes to research, uh, which also means that there's also a lot of steps and a lot of things that teachers and schools have to go through to make sure that they're implemented properly. The first one is the identification of what are called priority standards, skills, and topics. That's making sure that every single teacher in the department is clear on what the specific skills and topics are necessary for every content area. You can appreciate this because when you were a teacher, you participated in those PLCs. You participated in the opportunity for teachers to get together, clarify what every subject area is supposed to be teaching, clarify what those standards mean, and have an opportunity to make sure that the manner in which they grade and the manner in which they assess the students are consistent. That's something that uh, you know, has to be done kind of from the beginning. If we start uh, with not knowing what is supposed to be required uh, throughout the system and in each course, then you end up with a hodgepodge of approaches. And that's something that we really uh, wanted to make sure we avoided. The second one has to do with the regular assessment of students, not just testing. I think a lot of folks, uh, when they hear the word assessment, they automatically mean or automatically think that, oh, we're just going to do test, 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 but that's just not the case. When we assess students, that means you're really trying to get a better understanding of where they are with regards to their uh, uh, achievement level, uh, where they are with regards to their progress, and it allows teachers and schools to identify what types of supports are necessary to help those students uh, progress and move forward. So we do that both at the district level and at the classroom level where, uh, you know, they're able to monitor them much more closely. There's 10 different strategies. I'm going to try to just run through uh, these real quickly, but, you know, rest assured, these are all very uh, thoroughly dis uh, discussed and vetted with, you know, all levels of the department. They are very, um, they're supported by research. We don't just pull these things kind of out of the air, uh, you know, and uh, we're working really closely now with the schools to make sure uh, for their uh, successful implementation. The third one is support and strengthen regular classroom instruction uh, by providing teachers with a variety of training and multiple opportunities to learn. That's where we're providing additional uh, strategies uh, to uh, implement, identify and share effective lessons, strategies, and best practices. So through those PLCs, teachers are allowed to, to share what those best practices are. In some states, they're called lesson studies. In some states, they're called collaborative teams. Whatever terminology is utilized is uh, kind of the, the best uh, practice that's identified here is bringing teachers together so that they're able to share what that effective, effective instruction looks like. Number four is something that we're very happy that we're able to provide through our federal funding is high quality instructional resources. These are things that have been severely lacking for many, many years, uh, both the hard copies as well as the online ebook versions, right? So we're looking at books and reading material and all of these uh, supplemental instructional resources that are provided to teachers. I know that, uh, you know, one of the criticisms that was brought up a couple of months ago when we were buying books, the hard copies is, well, DOE, how come you're just, you know, buying the hard copies when we should, you know, just purchase the ebook and so on? Well, you know, I would, I don't know if it would surprise some people to know, but when you purchase the ebook, you know, simply by itself with the subscription, you end up almost paying the same amount as a hard copy. But when you purchase the hard copy, uh, a lot of the publishers give the ebook version for free. So we're getting the best of both worlds by having both the hard copies as well as the online versions of uh, these resources. We're starting with ELA and math this year, this current year, uh, moving into science and social studies in year two, which is next year, and followed by all other subject areas. So we're able to pro provide additional resources to uh, all of these classrooms, uh, not limited to just classroom libraries, additional STEM labs, robotics equipment, supplies, art supplies, and so on. So we're really providing a lot of these additional resources to teachers through our federal funding. Uh, part of those resources include the access to technology and supplemental online resources. So we're not just providing the hardware, but we're also providing the software and online um, access so that teachers can utilize these systems to help improve uh, and uh, support uh, student uh, achievement. Uh, in particular, the area of literacy and math, because as you know, as a teacher, one of the challenges is having multiple levels in the classroom and the quote unquote learning loss that's always talked about is knowing that some students are going to have gaps 
you know, in their learning. In some cases, it's going to be um, particular pieces in reading skill or, or in uh, particular areas of math skill. And you know, one of the things that uh, the system does is actually helps teachers assess students. Uh, to see where they're actually at, uh, where those gaps are, and they provide lessons or additional supplemental resources to support uh, students' practice and uh, achievement of those uh, skills. Number six is important, not just from a school level, but also at the district level, because we provide ongoing opportunities for collaboration and engagement at all levels to support schools, professional learning communities, and promote the understanding and alignment of efforts through district level training, workshops, and sharing sessions. We know that DOE is a big system, right? And if we had every teacher and every school kind of operate on their own without any alignment, uh, then you know that we're going to get a hodgepodge of strategies and a hodgepodge of achievement um, you know, throughout the, throughout the system. So we have a system in place that allows schools to share. You know, we have teachers, we have administrators, uh, you know, uh, that regularly kind of engage uh, in these sessions, especially with at the, at the school level, teachers even amongst themselves have to continue to engage to make sure that these strategies continue to move forward. Seven, incorporate strategies and lessons that will help students develop a growth mindset, lifelong learning skills and independence. One of the things, and this was not just in Guam, but it is something that was evident on Guam, is that a lot of the students who were more successful tended to be independent learners. They tended to be assertive. They tended to be, uh, you know, or have parents that were able to follow up uh, so that they actually made an effort to uh, access school or made an effort to actually learn the material. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to incorporate strategies in the system that help students uh, develop these lifelong learning skill set. The intent is for them to take greater ownership of their current learning and what we're calling develop a mission for their achievement and progress towards personal life goals. So it's really that ownership that, that we want to instill in our students. And we know that that starts at a very early age. So we wanna make sure that even as early as kindergarten or pre-K is that students are able to start doing things independently and gradually build uh, their, those lifelong learning skills. Eight is, is somewhat a new one, but came directly from our parents that have asked us for support is to provide training and support to parents and families in order to increase their capacity to support their children's education, educational, social, and emotional growth, and to build stronger relationships between families and schools. This was, uh, you know, again, one of those best practices that's out there where parents, for the first time, they had to be the primary you know, instructors or teachers of their children. You mentioned that, you know, it's basically, you know, the hard copy curriculum is basically independent study. Uh, that's true. You know, it's, it's uh, parents kind of had to step in there, you know, and so it wasn't independent just for the student, but, you know, it's also the, the parents had to get uh, engaged. So parents have asked for that type of supports and, and those have been provided in the sessions that were provided to parents. Some of the comments included wow, we didn't even realize that some of these strategies could be immediately implemented at home. Some of the parents didn't even realize that a lot of these strategies don't even cost money. So, you know, for example, reading with your kid, reading the newspaper with your child, uh, you know, uh, if you're in the grocery store or, or some other place, you know, talking to your kids about, uh, you know, what are the different types of produce, different colors, you know, help them um, uh, calculate the bill. All of these things that, that parents can, you know, easily do to help reinforce a learning that's happening in school. And the last two, we just got two more. The, the ninth one is provide additional supplemental instruction and learning activities outside of school time for struggling students and students in greatest need. You know, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, surprisingly, sometimes this number nine, everyone thinks this is like the first thing that you need to do. When in fact, research does not say that that's the first thing you need to do. This comes in only after core instruction is improved and core instruction is strong. But yes, we are uh, looking at providing a supplemental instruction additional time after school or during the summer for students who are struggling and students are, who are in the greatest need of that additional help. And then lastly, although it's number 10, uh, we wanna emphasize that this is not you know, doesn't mean it's the least important, but, you know, it's something that should be implemented, you know, throughout the school, every classroom and throughout the system, but implement activities at the school and classroom level that help establish and promote a positive school culture and engagement among students and staff, which supports everyone's social and emotional health and well-being. We know 
that already the pandemic itself and and the fact that students uh, you know are are trying to uh, address learning loss and so on it's already a stressful you know environment that's that's a given you know there's no need to uh, further exacerbate it or, or you know make it worse you know by having a, a school culture that's negative where people are always yelling people are always you know just complaining about things i mean it's it's really you know we have to find a way to make our, our school cultures more positive and welcoming and supportive uh, for you know, both our students and uh, you know, our, our staff as well as their families. So again, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry I took up so much time, but uh, you know, we, we really need to be clear that we're thinking this stuff through. This is not, you know, if we're, uh, you know I, I didn't present earlier in fear of taking up too much time and I apologize again for uh, doing so, but uh, this is something that we've been working on throughout the entire year. School principals have already been implementing, you know, majority of these strategies. The PLCs has been something that, you know, I think is one of the things that help us help us survive through the pandemic is teachers were already used to collaboration. They were already used to communicating. Uh, and all we did was kind of shift that online. So, you know, a lot of the things that we're, we're doing now is really also strengthening, um, you know, the work that has kind of already been done. Uh, so, you know, we're open to if you're if you hear of any other strategies that you would like us to, you know, consider and implement, you know, we're, we're totally open. And in fact, that's where we get a lot of our resources is administrators and teachers, you know, and, and in some cases, uh, community members sending us information or sending us articles that, uh, you know, we, may, we might want to consider with regards to implementation. So thank you for the question. I hope that 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 answers your your question and gives you a better idea of what you know, what we're doing and how we're approaching the whole concept of learning loss. Right. Thank you, Deputy um, uh, Sanchez. But um, I, I just wanna maybe, if you can clarify uh, this idea of learning loss. Um, so how, does, how do you quantify that? Or how do you identify that from the pandemic? Well, I know that I know that one one of the ways that we do is we do look at test scores, we do look at grades, we do look at you know our interim assessment scores, uh, you know. So uh, when we look at how we're going to be addressing it, those are what we're going to continue to be monitoring. Uh, we, as the superintendent noted, we don't necessarily quantify in terms of instructional uh, time, you know, or just adding days or adding hours. It's it's really a matter of how are our students doing in terms of their achievement. So uh, the three data points that we utilize are one, maybe the grades. And with the grades, as we, we noted in uh, strategy number one, uh, we believe that through the policy implementation of, let me go ahead and pull it up again. Through our implementation of what we are calling our standards-based grading system, we are actually aligning our grades to the achievement requirements of um, of each course that it, you, you have. So if you can think back to your time as a teacher, basically every teacher made up their grading system. So you decided how much tests, how much a test was worth, how much this was worth and, and so on. But there was really nothing that compelled teachers to focus on the actual achievement of the standards, right? Now with the grading system is teachers are required to focus on the standards and expectations for every course. And what that does is it really elevates the integrity and meaning of each grade that a student uh, uh, receives. So for example, in elementary school, when they say that a student is achieving at a level three, that means they're achieving the expectations of that class and that particular standard. You know, prior to that, whatever grade level a student was in and whatever grade they received, uh, the definition of that grade was really dependent on what uh, the teacher defined as you know achievement or, or so on. So really step one is really the student grades uh, that they receive as a measure of uh, the standards of that particular grade level. The second data point is our interim assessment uh, system, which is Ames Web for kindergarten through eighth grade, which helps us monitor student literacy and mathematics. So we're able to monitor uh, their progress from the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and at the end of the year in, in uh, reading and mathematics. And then of course, the last one is our uh, summative assessment scores, which is, uh, you know, the ACT Aspire was our main one uh, the last couple of years. We're now shifting to a new assessment system, mainly because the ACT Aspire is gonna be going out of print. So we have uh, our assessments that we're going to be utilizing next school year uh, that are gonna be different, but this year is the last year that we're gonna be use, utilizing the ACT Aspire. So we actually have uh, those, um, our regular end of the year standardized test scores. 
So those are the three data points that we will be using to address uh, or to identify the learning loss. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, you know it's so important. Uh, maybe this this is challenge could be seen as an opportunity, right? Because I think there was a lot of um, you know, if I can recall, uh, there were a lot of um, test scores that were below proficiency levels. And, you know, I think it just gets, uh, it exacerbates as you move up into the grade levels. So if I recall the, the middle, the elementary middle schools were okay, but then when, when they got to the high schools, there was a significant drop in the reading levels. And um, so I think, you know, the fact that there is, you're seeing a learning loss, even with all of the, um, the efforts that you're doing um, perhaps there, you know, there, there may be another way to, to um, th this provides an opportunity to, to reevaluate the process that, that uh, GDOE is doing and seeing how we can use this opportunity to really promote uh, literacy, because that I think is really key uh, for students getting ahead, uh, their ability to comprehend uh, also mathematical skills are are something that we re that needs to be uh, definitely um, these foundational skills need to be worked on. I think, of course, at the younger ages, um, they're, they're, it's more impactful, right? Because their brains are still developing, um, and more plasticity, I guess, allows for you know learning capabilities. Um, but yeah, but I think in regards to the the time, uh, if I can recall, you know, being being a teacher, you know, twenty four days is almost half a quarter. And a lot happens in half a quarter, and so uh, having to uh, exempt, uh, the, you know, the reduction in instructional days really puts more pressure on the teachers to try to catch up. Uh, whatever learning loss has a, has a has a has taken place. Uh, so I think you know the that that is a concern for me. Um, you know, having to reduce the the number of of hours or, or instructional time, um, but I do you know. Commend, for, commend you for all your work that you put into this. But um, yeah, I think, you know, ultimately, you know, we have to ensure that, you know, the students are getting, gaining the skills, the necessary skills, uh, foundational skills um, to be successful in, you know, society. Um, and um, so, yeah, I'm willing to hear and maybe work with GDOE uh, on any uh, plans. Um, so yeah, it's nice to see all, all the administrators here. <laughs> and I, I, I see all the work that you're doing, but I think that, um, you know, I think it's important that we all go back to, you know, the students, like what's gonna make them successful. I know all the work that you put into this, uh, being that I was also part of that as well. Um, but I thank you for your, your response and look forward to further dialogue. Uh, so thank you. Um, so actually maybe there's one more question, federal dollars. Uh, maybe this question is for uh, superintendent. Um, is how much, I guess, um, how much is set aside for addressing learning loss? Superintendent Fernandez, this question's for him, if he's still here. I guess he's not. Yeah, I, can, I can provide that. I can provide that number also, but let me let me just pull it up. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull up the, the exact number. I don't want to give an incorrect number. I think the superintendent just came back in the room. So, okay. He's connected. If you don't have that amount, uh, we can always get that uh, answer later, uh, Deputy uh, Sanchez. But yeah, I think um, if there's money available, we, maybe perhaps we can utilize those funds to really address the core, the, the root of the issue, right? And um, literacy, math skills are, are very important to, to be successful citizens in, in, um, in society. And um, yeah, whatever you can do um, to help improve those, those, uh, those numbers. Um, yeah. that so uh, for the, sorry, yeah, just for the ARP funding, we have about if we add everything total, it's about $69, $70 million. 
Okay. And then uh, we have to get the number for the, a, the ESF1 and the ESF2. So with regards to the ARP funding, it's about $70 million. A lot of that has to go to, again, technology, purchase of instructional materials, uh, purchase of, you know, some, some of it is supplemental personnel and uh, after school time and, and summer school time, uh, as well as uh, a lot of it goes to supplies and materials for the classroom. Yeah, thank you. But if I can put a plug for more reading skills, I mean, that's so critical. Um, you know, we're seeing in the high school level um, students, I, I think there's even a, a decline in the ability of uh, the reading ability. And, um, you know, I really so that's, that, that's why we started with that's why we started with English language arts and math mm -hmm. is we recognize how those are critical. So the funding first went to English language arts and math, which includes uh, uh, reading, writing and, and uh, so on. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate all your hard work in that. And um, definitely my office is open if uh, you need anything as far as that is concerned. But I'm definitely want, would like to push for that, advocate for, for that. Thank you. Thank you for all I mean, your yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Perez. Uh, we do apologize. The superintendent had some technical issues. He was trying to log back on, but uh, he was unable to. But we want to thank uh, uh, the team at DOE, thank you very much, and to all the administrators from our various schools and our board uh, for being here today, for answering all our questions, for provi providing this information so that we can uh, move forward on these policy recommendations that you've given us for these uh, waivers uh, for this school year. Uh, we appreciate that and we'll take all of this into consideration when making those decisions. I'm sure we will see you all uh, again very soon. And I want to, uh, again, thank you for your hard work, uh, everything that you're doing for our students in continuing uh, the school year. Uh, with that, the time now is 1147 AM and this informational hearing uh, is adjourned. The committee will accept any written testimony uh, from the public or any of our school administrators or the department, and it can be emailed to Senator TC Nelson at guamlegislature.org or delivered to the office of Senator Talina Nelson at suite 202A173 Aspinall Avenue, Hagunya, Guam, 96910. And a recording of today's hearing will also be available at the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. The time again is 11.48 a.m and we are adjourned. Sidious Masi, everyone. Take care and be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.